Watch this. They spent $500,000 for a three-month investigation, and the city of Boise still has zero idea if racism is rampant in its police department. Well, they're about to. At least learn what a half a million dollars will tell you. Pink Floyd fans have for sure listened to Dark Side of the Moon while staring at the moon, right? But how about seeing the moon up close? Well, that would be a far out way to celebrate a 50th anniversary. Lake Hazel Road is a pretty well-known South County through fair, but maybe you didn't know why it's called Lake Hazel or if there was ever really a lake. I did not see any police officer or other employee here in this agency treat people poorly because of their race. And that is what Boise Police Chief Ron Weininger told us two days ago. But what did the rank and file officers tell an independent investigation team about racism in the department? That's the question. Oh, we're about to find out the answer. Back in November, racist comments by a retired BPD captain became public, and the city launched an investigation into that officer's career and to find out if racism was a systemic problem within the agency. They set aside half a million dollars to pay for a D.C. law firm to look into it, but the money ran out before the investigation was complete. But what they found out so far is about to be unveiled publicly. Boise Mayor Lauren McLean told Joe Paris what she knows about the report, which actually isn't much yet. Just today we actually confirmed with the independent investigator that he will be zooming into the city council work session on Tuesday to present um, what he's done and what he's found. This is a completely independent investigation. Yeah. You haven't seen it. You'll see it on Tuesday at the same time as, uh, as everyone else. What is the importance of that aspect to you? To me, it was important to bring somebody in that had no ties to the community, that had experience in doing interviews like this, um, to then share with the community, the council and myself, um, the results of what they found. And what can the, the people of Boise expect on Tuesday? So, so the public should expect to hear a rundown of what he's done, um, to hear a rundown of you know, what he learned. And then I would expect, because we've said we're going to move on and have the department take a look at this, um, to hear as well what more could be done if we were to choose to spend a lot more money, or better, better than that, um, have with the council and the chief um, decide how the city proceeds um, if there's anything else we need to look at. And I know that the findings we'll, we'll find out on Tuesday, but some people are making it, you know, is there's going to be one of two answers. Boise police is racist or they're not. And I feel like there's probably more intricacy there that people should expect. It's not going to be one big final answer. I would say that like everything in Boise, there's always more than, you know, this or this, right? Like we're a community of folks that care deeply about each other, that are committed to remaining safe, to holding folks accountable, to providing service to residents of Boise. And in, in all of those situations, you find nuance. To you, what's the value of the half a million dollars and why was it so important to do this? Well, I would say, what's the value of making sure that um, we're doing everything we can, the Boise Police Department is doing everything it can to keep our community safe, to hold everyone accountable, um, and to make sure that we're serving Boiseans in the best possible way. So there you have it. Tuesday night at City Council will be very interesting. And, and Brian, just you know, to clarify something you and I were talking about here just during the story, uh, the mayor, the mayor's staff, the entire city, none of them have seen this report before it's unveiled publicly on Tuesday. That surprised me because I figure if there's going to be a bombshell here, yeah. somebody would want to know about it before just like, here everybody knows. Yeah. And I think, though, that part of this is the transparency of, look, we're all in this together. We're all going to find this out together. This is a third party that has no relation to anyone in the city, hopefully. <laughs> but uh, you know what I mean. Right. Like, it's, 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 we're all going to find out together, and I think that's something that the, the city of Boise has really prioritized through my conversations with them. Of Look, we've lost trust through Boise police. We understand some of the stories on Channel 7 have not put a good light on Boise police, so we know we need to be very careful and transparent with this whole process. I understand this investigation went three months. They only spent half a million dollars. Is there plans to do more to continue this investigation, to find out more? I think we'd have to find out on Tuesday. You know, if there's something that comes out on Tuesday that warrants more investigation, the mayor and her staff may decide that they want to invest more in this. At the same time, though, the answers that they get on Tuesday may say, okay, we're comfortable with this and we know what the action, you know, the new chief and really within the department and city that we have to take. But again, we'll find out on Tuesday. All right, stand by. Thanks, Joe. Mm -hmm. Here's a question for you. Was the election stolen? Believe it or not, it's still a hot topic in some parts, even to this day. 
even after Biden has been president for more than three years. Okay, so coming from that question is always the idea of election integrity. Integrity. The 2020 election opened the floodgates to a whole lot of criticism, chaos, controversy over the election system, even here in Idaho. So now local to federal elections are trying to be as transparent as possible with them, which is why the Ada County Elections Office tested the logic and accuracy of their election system today ahead of the upcoming election on Tuesday. The test includes hand counting a predetermined set of finished ballots and then putting those ballots into the election software. Make sure those ballots are read correctly and that all those numbers match up. So hopefully this is going to help gain the trust of the community. This is just a final run through and a chance for the public to see and make sure that all of our equipment is working properly. So we have a set of 253 ballots that we mark in a particular way. This room is what is called an air gapped room. So there is no internet in this room. A few other things, you can see cameras in the corners. Uh, these are part of 13 cameras that we have throughout the warehouse that are live streamed at all times. If you were to take a look, you'll see that there are zeros all the way down. Nothing has been reporting. So we run all three different types of ballots. So we have election day ballots, early voting ballots, and absentee ballots. So this contest is a vote for two contest. In this instance, we've marked three. The reason we do that is we want to test the logic of the machine and make sure that the machine is accurately reading that and rejecting that ballot. There on this side here, you can see a tape election seal. This is actually a tamper-proof seal. That sticker will read as void if that compartment has been opened. Once that drive is recorded, we'll take it and go back over to the count system, and that count system will actually tabulate the ballots uh, at that time to give us results. If you were to take a regular USB and plug it into any one of these machines, it won't recognize it. We hand tallied this independently before we ran this test. That's exactly what we hand tallied through the process and what the machine has shown as well. So throughout this process, that confirms to us that the logic of the machines is working correctly. They are accurate and they are ready for election day. Okay, so they're ready and after that test today, they're locked down. The software is secured until election day on Tuesday the 16th. You can find a voter guide, by the way, if you want to know what is happening in your area, find it at our website, ktvb.com. We have been celebrating a big anniversary here at KTVB, the 70th anniversary of the TV station, but we're not the only ones appreciating a long history made timely by a nice round number. Pink Floyd and Dark Side of the Moon, all you Pink Floyd fans out there, the album turns 50 this year, and it's the best-selling album of the 70s. It sold 45 million copies worldwide, and now the College of Southern Idaho has a whole new way to experience it. Andrew Bartline talked to the CSI Planetarium manager today. Herit Planetarium, I believe, is the name of that place. Mm -hmm. And they have a new show, which is just directly for Pink Floyd fans. Yeah, and it's about this album very specifically, hence the 50th anniversary. So no surprise there. That Dark Side of the Moon album with their 50th anniversary, Pink Floyd released a show specifically for planetariums across the world, and it's called 50 Years in a Heartbeat. But venues have to apply for the show and then get approved for it. The only place in Idaho to see it down in Twin Falls at CSI's Planetarium. Pink Floyd has kind of always been tied with planetariums. Back in 73, when they released the album, uh, they had a, a deal at the London Planetarium. And their music has always played out well in the dome theaters or visual surrounding. And Dark Side of the Moon centers around themes of uh, time and space. It's only available through the end of March 2024, so just through the one-year uh, period of time anniversary. And we were fortunate enough to uh, apply and be one of the planetariums selected to run this program. What was that application process like? Was it pretty robust? Did you guys just throw your name in the ring and cross your fingers? You, you might think it was pretty robust, but it actually surprisingly wound up to be really easy for us. I don't know about it for everybody. But because we have this past history with the company that produced it, uh, having uh, licensed five other of their shows, they're familiar with me and our venue. Yeah, what is that difference of seeing something like this in a planetarium rather than, like there's a trailer online, and obviously this is just my little laptop screen. What really is the difference? So uh, when you take a look, if you visit our website and you watch the trailer, you're seeing a rectangular image. Well, the planetarium is a domed environment. So you've got this dome screen. You're sitting in the midst of it. It surrounds you. So there are scenes out in the solar system in the show. Uh, you're around Jupiter or Saturn, and you've got the stars around you. Uh, there's a segment in it uh, 
uh, one of the songs, you're flying it through the rings of Saturn. So the rings of Saturn are composed of all kinds of uh, icy chunks and rocky bits and everything. So when you're flying through these rings, these things are literally coming past you. Uh, you know, kind of imagine driving in a car in a snowstorm at night, you know, and the snowflakes are coming out. Well, that's kind of what it is, except there's these boulders and chunks flying by you. So it's it's an immersive environment. And then you got the Dolby 5.1 sound that just surrounds you. So it's an environmental experience. The show is roughly 43 minutes, and it's the album in its entirety, but Greenewald says it might be a little bit longer. It is a little bit longer, I should say, if you count in credits at the end of the show. The Planetarium also, Brian, is only selling like 50 tickets ahead of time per mm -hmm. show. They have 140 seats in total, and they do that because if people come from out of town, they don't want all those tickets to sell it ahead of time. You drive from out of town, and then tough luck. So. Gotcha. I want to also, it's the Herit Center is the school for the astronomy. Faulkner Planetarium is the name of the place. I Google's misspoke. your friend. It is. It is my friend. It is. Thank well, you very much, Andrew. <laughs> okay, so something else that's quirky happening here in Idaho, the Paranormal Cirque. What is that, you might ask? Well, we have the same question. And there's a warning, though, if you're afraid of clowns or just scary things in general. You might not want to watch this. You could say it's like the circus combined with theater and even cabaret, but also scarier and more wicked, dangerous maybe, and I guess sexy, right? Okay, cool. I guess you have to find out for yourself. If you're at least 18, otherwise you're asked to bring your parents with you to kind of check it out. It's at the Boise Town Square Mall parking lot. You've seen it, maybe if you've driven by it, the big tent there, and it's a big white tent. Show starts at 7.30, goes through the 14th of this month, and tickets start at 10 bucks. There's a lot of odd names out there across the state of Idaho. Crouch, Peekaboo, Good Grief. Yeah, that's actually a place. What about a place like Lake Hazel? Seems pretty normal if there was actually a lake. It's that time again. This is where you get to tell us what you think. Just text us at the number on your screen, 208-321-5614. Don't forget to put in your name and the hashtag the 208. That way we know it's for us and who it's from. Also, keep them clean, concise, and especially clever so we can share it at the end of the show. As we like to remind you every once in a while, this show is a conversation. We ask for your comments, your questions during the show, sometimes after, some of which we actually are able to share at the end of the show. And some of those, well, they may take a few days to flesh out. We got this text last week from Kathy in Boise. We can all guess how most streets in Boise are named, she says. For example, Five Mile, Ten Mile, Meridian Road, etc. I'm curious how Lake Hazel got its name. There's no lake, and who is Hazel? Well, yep, we've done the story on Meridian Road, which is named for Idaho's initial point and the principal meridian that runs north from there. Five mile, 10 mile, maybe not what you think. It's not because of their distance from really anything in particular. They were just named after creeks. Okay, so what about the lake, as in Lake Hazel? For anybody that has driven through South Ada County and you found yourself on that road or driving by any of the schools that bear the name, you may have asked the same set of questions. Who's this Hazel and where's this lake? Well, there isn't one. But for a short time, there once was. 
There's the road, the village, and the lions. But that leaves the elementary question of, what about the lake of Lake Hazel? All right, let's go back to June of 1902, when Congress passed the Reclamation Act, which is just a fancy way of saying, let's get some irrigation going here so we can reclaim this dry land and make it livable to encourage settlement. From 1902 to 1907, the Reclamation Act approved about 30 projects across the West. One of those was the Boise Project, which would create a diversion dam on the Boise River, expand the New York Canal, and dig the Deer Flat Reservoir in Nampa, later known as Lake Lowell. But Reclamation was already underway in the Treasure Valley. A man named David R. Hubbard, a board member of the Boise Valley Irrigation Association, agreed to create a series of six reservoirs in Southern Ada County, all of them connected. There was Hubbard Lake, of course, Cuna Lake, Catherine Lake, Watkins Lake, Rawson Lake, and Painter Lake. Painter Lake would soon become Lake Hazel for reasons unknown, but it and the others would soon be gone. After Hubbard finished five of those six lakes, he stopped to not interfere with the much bigger plans of the Boise Project, which began in 1906. Since diversion and storage stopped, the water dried up and the lakes were left to the dustbin of history. Yeah, so all those lakes dried up, except Hubbard. It's now known as Hubbard Reservoir Recreation Area, which is about 12 miles southwest of Boise. A lot of that information, by the way, came from research done by Madeline Kelly Buckendorf for a National Register of Historic Places application. So the question, who is this hazel, that still is unanswered, we're not sure. But now we know there at least there was a lake a long time ago. And if anyone can tell us out there where that lake actually was or who Hazel was, we'd love to hear about it. Well, good afternoon and heading into the evening. You can see we had the beautiful sunshine for today. Here's the Boise foothills and later this afternoon, some clouds are showing up. You know, over the past couple of days, we've had a few showers, 
back in some of those mountains and still we're looking for that here, especially for Sunday afternoon that something could actually back up enough to provide a shower or a thunderstorm either late Saturday night or early Sunday morning. Right now, I'm just going to show you, though, that uh, if you planted your garden already, things are looking pretty good. If you look at the averages of below first of the last 32 degrees. Now, today is the 11th, so you can see we're past it for most days. But even more important is the 36 degrees, the last frost. In other words, uh, usually the average is somewhere here within the next week or two. But just to let you know that some of the nighttime lows, they're warming up. So when you think about the next week or so, look at these temperatures. We're nowhere near freezing. They're basically into the 60s. At least it looks like it's a freeway for gardens this year. Now, when we move late May into June, there's still a, a isolated chance of some frost, but just keep watching it. But for right now, looks pretty good. 1961, the year the Berlin Wall was built, the year man first went to space, and most around the country are enjoying breakfast at Tiffany's. Guess how much it cost for a gallon of gas back then? 27 cents. And here we are 62 years later, and we're still talking about a wall. We're about to send another crew to the moon and 27 cents. Well, that would only get you about a squeeze of the handle at the gas station. You know where you don't have to squeeze the handle to fill your own tank? Dick Sola's Chevron in Boise, where it's proof the more things change, the more they stay the same in today's 208 redial. In this day and age of do it yourself, there's still one place where you don't. Need a little gas, right? This is Dick's Chevron in Boise, the only gas station in the Treasure Valley that is full time, full service. Yeah, hey, run her up to 3070 today, ma'am. Meaning you pull in, and 82 year old Dick Sola comes out to pump your petrol. And he will wash your windows, and he will even ask you if you need your oil checked. Pamela Sherman has been a regular patron of Dick's for 17 years, for almost two decades. Yeah, so he's our favorite. Hey, Mr. Bauman. Some have been filling up for a lot longer. Yeah, you talked me into it. Like Dean Bauman. A little oil. Who's been a steady customer since the early 60s. A little warmer today. Yeah, that cold weather killed you, you know. That was shortly after Dick bought the gas station on the corner of 32nd and State Streets. Yep, yep. In 1961. Oh, man, it was only a two-way road out here. You know, a lot of changes. Back then. Can't remember all the changes. Full service was the standard. <laughs> But since the 70s, gas stations have been sliding swiftly toward self-service. Oh well. Leaving Dick as a dying breed. Ain't there one on somewhere there? There used to be. When he's not waiting on customers, you can find Dick in the garage. Here, oh well, oh well. he does a bit more than the basics of maintenance. That's what they told you, huh, Clunk? Yep. The tools he uses are about as old as the wall they hang on. Yep. And during downtimes, race cars are his hobby. Everybody's got to have a hobby. Can't work all the time, right? Except Dick does work all the time. Most of the time, yeah. <laughs> He's here by himself seven days a week. Sundays, I only work from 10 to 4. Sure, you may pay a few more cents a gallon for gas, but what you get is... Service. <laughs> it's a simple business model. No snacks, no sodas. No, I had a Coke machine, but the dang thing broke down, so they took her out. But I didn't sell that much Coke anyway. A computer? It's here somewhere. I mean, it's on the back room. But most of the paperwork is done on actual paper. <laughs> he came to Idaho as an airman in 1954. Well, you're almost to World War II. No, I ain't that old. Mom. And in more than five decades of business, <laughs> he's raised three kids and lost his wife to cancer 25 years ago. It's a look into the way things used to be at Dick Chevron. Well, well. And sometimes. There's nothing falling off, so. Like an old car. Don't look like anyway. You can't find anything wrong with it. Yep, can't win them all. It's just old. Not only that, it, you know, it, things wear out no matter what, you know. Everything wears out. Well, not everything. Got to be doing something, right? You don't mind me eating lunch. Dick is one of a kind, that's for sure. Brian Holmes. Kind of like the old days, you know? Idaho's News Channel 7. <laughs> not everything wears out. When we first met Dick back in 2016, he told us he had no intention to update the gas station, told us it was too expensive and he's too old. Those are his words, by the way. But that is why we redialed that story today. Because today, Dick Sola turned 90 years old and he's still working seven days a week. In fact, he works from 10 to four most days and still pumping gas. He'll still wash your windshield if you need it and check your oil as well. 
Yeah, he's going to continue to be there from 10 to 4, seven days a week, which is pretty impressive. Want to stop by, though, and wish Dick a happy birthday? He's still open because he was going to hang out a little bit today. He said he's going to be open for maybe another 30 minutes or so, maybe till 6.30. Whatever. He's Dick. He's 90. He does what he wants. Your comments today with regard to the Ada County Elections Office testing out their election system. We got this one from Jose in Caldwell. Those that have drunk the Kool-Aid, there is nothing that is going to convince them there isn't a conspiracy going on in our elections. Yeah, but it's worth seeing how it actually operates. What is the reasoning behind early voting, asked Tony in New Meadows. Well, I guess if you're not going to be around on Election Day, you want to get in and do it because you know you're going to be out of town. That's a good way, and your vote still counts. They don't tally those votes, by the way, until Election Day, so there's no way to know ahead of time which way people are leading it, if they vote early. The lake in Lake Hazel is a state of mind, not matter. You're right. Doesn't have to be there. Just know that it was. And it was probably awesome. We'll see you tomorrow.